So I'll keep this super brief because I, I I do want to just um, get to get to chatting with with my bud T. As Anthony noted, the question that animates this beauty is a kind of existential question that I think doesn't get discussed enough these days, which is roughly, you know, why why value this life that we didn't choose? I mean, no one had a chat with us before we before we existed and asked us if we wouldn't mind being these conscious beings on this strange planet spinning in space um, in these kind of odd circumstances that no one, you know, in some fundamental sense, no one really understands or, or knows much about. And the question uh, has bite because you might think, well, you know, there's a lot of good things in life, but it's not clear why we uh, should care about the things that were just sort of given. Um, if we were handed the keys to a Ferrari and, um, you know, said, hey, this is yours now. It's not clear that you, like, there's any imperative for you to really care about it. Yeah, it's valuable. You can you can admit that, but, um, you know, it's uh, it's expensive to upkeep. It's it's a finicky drive. It's uh, has bad suspension. Uh, it garners all this attention. There's a lot of these like sort of disvalues associated with the thing, even though it is you know valuable. And it's kind of up to you to to, to care about it. And why why should you? Um, so analogously with life, we didn't consent to it. Uh, why should we? Why should we care at all about it? And the book proceeds by mining for wisdom these what I call existential imperatives that seem to tap us into the thought that life really is valuable. And I think it's kind of mysterious how they do this. So a lot of these are cliches like, you know, you only live once or carpe diem or live in the moment or treat yourself. And so the book, um, each chapter kind of focuses on, on one or two of these existential imperatives and critiques them as in a lot of ways kind of incoherent or ethically problematic but then ultimately finds that they contain this kernel of aesthetic wisdom that they each tap into this idea that when you value beauty, your life can be worth living. It's like a, valuing beauty is a way of tapping into uh, the value of being alive. So um, there's a lot of details there. There's a whole theory of beauty, a kind of communitarian theory that I develop. And the idea is that beauty is self-replicating or in Plato's sort of ancient terms, beauty begets beauty. And um, I fill that thought out in a way that I think philosophers haven't really done. The thought is that in valuing beauty, we do various things to create beauty and to further this practice of valuing beauty that is such that when we engage in it, we just happen to find answers to the question, you know, why value this life that, that you didn't choose? Well, the book's thought is get into valuing beauty and you'll enter this dynamic community of people doing the same. And when you do that, you will find your own answers to the question. Um, maybe it's in the form of a poet that you love or in actually writing poetry. Maybe it's in the form of the natural beauty of the high desert in the West, uh, or maybe it's in the form of making music with a band um, or going to concerts uh, of a band that you love and so on. So at the bottom of all this is a kind of attempt to uh, justify aesthetic value by engaging in aesthetic valuing, we together, we sort of develop and protect and disseminate answers to the question in the form of beauty. Um, there's a lot of other things we do in aesthetic life, but at the core of sort of the justification of like, why does this matter? Why does beauty matter? I think is this answer to this deep existential question. So just to wrap up, there's a lot of details that T and I will talk about, I'm sure. But I thought I'd, I thought I'd say something about what I think is kind of unique about the book as a piece of philosophy, which is a kind of note on its on its normative force. So you might wonder, well, are you saying that everyone should love beauty? Are you saying that uh, there's a kind of categorical demand to love beauty? Um, and the answer is that I wrote this book 
in a very, very sort of personal way. So the voice of the book is very deliberately not the voice of sort of formal academic philosophy. And I think as a result, the book has a kind of peculiar normative force. So I wrote this book uh, when I was becoming a father for the first time, sort of bringing children into this world who themselves haven't consented to being alive. And I wanted to write something as a father that I could most sincerely tell my children about why they might value this life that they didn't choose to live. And I tried to do this in a way that is true to the book's thesis. So I tried to write it in a kind of lyrical and hopefully beautiful way that sort of embodies the very thesis of the book. Um, and so I think that as a result, the, the normative force of the, of the, of the, of the proposal is sort of peculiar in a way it's it's this it's the force of a father you know a sort of thoughtful philosophically minded father sincerely telling his children this is what i think i can say to you in all honesty about why why you can value this life that you didn't choose to live and it's it's to say you know find your way of engaging with with in the practice of aesthetic valuing and loving beauty and um and you know i i hope that you find find your answers Hey everyone, that was awesome, Nick. So I have a first question. So um, when Nick and I were talking about this book long ago, his first version of it was, T, I'm writing a book about YOLO, what YOLO means and <laughs> what that motto means. And then a few years later, it's like, T, everything's changed. I'm having a kid. It's totally changed how I approach the book. But it's still the same book. It's still about YOLO, but it's bigger now. So do you want to take mm -hmm. us through how that changed what you were doing and how yeah what this incipient father thing did for you yeah totally i mean i i did i i right when almost almost immediately when i finished um on being awesome my first sort of public facing book i started writing this essay on yolo because it, it just i don't know i just it just sort of like flowed out um and i thought yolo is really really peculiar because if you only live once um, well, the, the circumstances of our life are such that life is delicate. Uh, it's, you know, you can be smashed by a rock. You can be, <laughs> you can be taken out by a tiny virus. Um, uh, there's lots of dangers, illnesses, um, threats. So if you only live once and, and life has this sort of like precarious flavor, why not think that YOLO should inspire the exact opposite thought? You only live once, so... As a, as a sort of skit in SNL put it, you ought to look out. Like you should just like step back and like, um, instead of like the opposite thing, which is what people take YOLO to mean, which is like, you only live once. So like jump into the world, like take risks, like be adventurous, be spontaneous. Um, and when I started thinking about that, I realized a similar problem occurs with carpe diem. Um, okay, people often translate that as seize the day. Well, what does that mean? I mean, it's not obvious at all. Some people take it to mean that you should do everything you can to pursue your goals. Other people take it to mean that you should just like chill out in a hammock all day um, and do nothing. And like, those are just like completely opposite thoughts. So if there's actually wisdom in any of these kind of generic cliches that seem to be or inspiring or that actually seem to work on people, then what is that? then what is that wisdom? And so the book grew out of like thinking through uh, the thought that, you know, YOLO is not the only cliche that has this kind of dual character. On the one hand, it seems to really work to inspire people to embrace life. But on the other hand, when you sort of think about them critically, they seem to kind of fall through, fall through your fingers. And then the pandemic happened. Uh, and so, and, uh, you know, in fact, the, the real story behind that is like the, the book I, I pitched to, to uh, the editor who, who ended up acquiring it, uh, is it just wasn't a book I really wanted to write at the end of the day um, when the pandemic hit like a lot of people had these kind of reorientations in terms of what they wanted to do with their life and as a writer I just didn't want to write the same book um, so a lot of the content is in there but it's, it has a very different sort of framing and focus so one I, I just want to pick up on one thing you said because about YOLO because I think it's going to come back again for beauty how important is it for the nature of a motto like YOLO or Carpe Diem, that it's deeply ambiguous, that it's not like some clear, explicit mission statement, but it's just like, 
weird, hyper interpretable. Does that metaphor? Does that make it like a better life motto or a worse one? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, what you know, in general, why is it that these cliches have this have this character? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I don't off the top of my head. Don't. I mean, a lot of a lot of sort of inspirational phrases do have this. Like they're, it's like they're lobbed at you, and you know you're sort of invited to make of them whatever you, whatever you can. Um, it's almost like we recognize that I'm supposed to be inspired by this, so like I got to tap into my sources of inspiration. Um, but uh, yeah, but I mean, I guess you know, it's funny too because like you only live once works on people even when they don't believe that they only live once, you know, a lot of people who are like, say, Christian, or believe in an afterlife of some sort, you know, um, they still like, find this phrase inspiring. And so uh, they're, they're mysterious in, in, in more ways than one. Um, yeah. I mean, let me, let me give you a few possible options. As I was reading your book, I was really thinking about, because you, you really talk a lot about um, how, like, you make so much, and I found so interesting, how open to interpretation these things were. And one mm -hmm. possibility, so the philosopher Elizabeth Camp says, what's really valuable about metaphors rather than explicit statements is they wear their vagueness on their face. Like, you know, they're, they're not claiming to be final. Another mm -hmm. thing that some people have said is something like, if someone just gives you a target that's easy, you don't, you don't have to grapple with it. But something like YOLO is open to interpretation that you have to, you have to make it your own. And I wonder if that makes them better in your book. Yeah, I think I think they do need to be open to interpretation. I I just I also think though that the the mystery of them goes deeper because as a matter of fact, we don't tend to interpret YOLO as you ought to look out. It's funny, right, when uh when SNL does that. Um even though when you think about it, that's a perfectly legitimate interpretation. Um and so why is it that when we're when we're given this phrase or we think it, um, despite its sort of genuine cringeworthiness, it can still work. Uh, it can still sort of tap us into this, this thought that we should embrace life. Um, yeah. So one of the reasons I'm asking about this is because I'm really interested in whether the conception of beauty that you have is this very specific thing or this very like kind of vague, nebulous thing. And I can already mm -hmm. see that the chat is lighting up with people being like, what does he mean by beauty? Is it just pleasure? Is it just one specific thing? So mm -hmm. let me start by asking you, yeah. like, how specific is your conception of beauty? Is it like, you know, yeah. the classical Western European, it has to be grace and symmetry. Is it something stranger and more yeah. nebulous? Um, it's something stranger, but I don't think it's more nebulous. I think it's crystal clear, um, but <laughs> I'll try to put some meat on those, on the bones, but um, so it's not a hedonic, it's not a hedonic conception. And in fact, uh, a lot of it's motivated by the fact that I'm, I'm, well, there's sort of two things. One, I'm, I'm fairly, convinced of a lot of the criticisms of aesthetic hedonism. And I'm also just interested in this sort of project in aesthetics that people are engaged in right now, which is hedonism, aesthetic hedonism has really been the only player in town for so long. Um, and despite it being criticized really forcefully and interestingly by, by several philosophers, um, alternatives haven't really been developed in much detail. And so, what I've been up to in the last several years is, is developing a detailed alternative to hedonism. So the view that I uh, present in this book and that I'm working on in a lot more detail in, in sort of academic facing work, um, I call aesthetic communitarianism. And the thought there is that uh, aesthetic value, this is sort of a, a tautology that I work with. Aesthetic value is what's worthy of aesthetic valuing. The twist is that for me, aesthetic valuing is a social practice that is governed by this good of aesthetic community. And so what we're doing when we're engaging with, with aesthetic value, creating it, sharing it, imitating it, using it to express ourselves is essentially getting ourselves in a position to be in aesthetic community with other people. Um, and that's the sort of the highest good of aesthetic life is that is being in this aesthetic community. Um, so yeah, there's a lot more details, obviously, but um, I hope so, that answers your question. Where it's like not it's it's a very alternative view, but it's not but it's not so nebulous that um, yeah. 
Yeah. So, I mean, this this opens a door that I'm like so interested in. So you actually said something in your intro that made me understand something maybe about your view that I hadn't seen before. So mm. let me try it this way. Okay, let me explain a little bit of something I think about games. So in a lot of games, the thing you're pursuing isn't the actual purpose, right? So you are in a party game, you're trying to win. What you actually want is to have fun. I'm a rock climber. I try to get to the top, but what I actually want is to relax. So a lot of people in the space call these self-effacing goal, call this stuff like a self-effacing goal. Like you can't relax directly by trying to relax. So you aim at something else, like getting up a cliff. And that's the thing that brings you to relax. So I wonder if, so what you said was people pursue beauty and in that pursuit, they stumble across what makes their life really meaningful. So I'm trying to figure out whether what you think is beauty is the meaning of life or when you pursue beauty, you will find your own meaning of life. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So my answer is really more the latter thing. So um, the thought is, it's not so much a prediction, like when you pursue beauty, you will. It's uh, it's more a kind of justification of of the practice of aesthetic valuing. I mean, what at the at the end of the day or at the bottom of the you know well of justification can we appeal to 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 justify this this practice? And the thought is the fact that given the structure of the practice of aesthetic valuing, when you engage in the practice, you will either create or discover or you know propagate these uh these answers to the question and that's sort of like a deeper existential justification i think if we didn't have that uh available to us in the practice of aesthetic valuing it would still be good for a lot of reasons but it wouldn't be quite as good like it wouldn't be quite uh, to me it, it makes it kind of indispensable or, or deeply deeply satisfying as opposed to like you know, if if aesthetic value is just pleasure, I mean, you can get pleasure from a lot of different things. You don't have to get it from from aesthetic valuing. Um, but I think aesthetic community is extremely unique and specific to the practice of, practice of aesthetic valuing, and that it's the kind of thing that when we engage in it, we find these deeper existential satisfactions sort of available to us. So I'm I'm still I said I feel like I and a lot of members of the audience still have this like what is it about beauty or why beauty? So let me try these questions. Yeah. So um, what's special about beauty that makes it more likely for me to stumble across the meaning of life when I'm pursuing it than some other pursuits that look nearby? So for example, what about pursuing success or pursuing friendship? Or someone just mentioned Buddhism in the chat, pursuing mindfulness, right? Like mm -hmm. why are, it seems like you think that beauty is a special route. So what makes beauty special here? Yeah, so, um, well, I would have to agree with, so there's a chapter sort of on mindfulness. Um, and I think friendship is a profound source of aesthetic community. So I would, I would definitely like collect those in my bag as it were, as, as like, you know, also aesthetic. Um, Pursuing success, uh, you know, I think beauty has has uh, a kind of, so one of the things that I talk about when in the, um, in the Carpe Diem chapter is that a lot of people interpret Carpe Diem as a kind of um, pursue success, uh, do, you know, get shit done, do what you can do, like tackle everything, do it all this kind of like, I don't know, yeah, success-oriented sense of, of seize the day. And I think that there's a sense in which it's always going to be dissatisfying because you're always pursuing something that's incomplete, right? Like the next paycheck, the next promotion, the next book, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And when I discuss Carpe Diem, I talk about this thought that, you know, seize the day is actually a bad translation of Horace's odes. It's actually, you know, harvest the day is a better translation. And the phrase that follows it is trust as little as possible in the future. And so that counts against this idea that, you know, when we're pursuing success in the, in the typical fashion, we're trusting in the future for everything. Our whole sense of self is like deferred. And 
um, the idea that you should harvest the day and lower your trust in the future is the idea that you should find sort of the sources of your of your will's fulfillment in what's right before you. And when you seek those sources, the thought is you find beauty. Um, the beauty of, you know, the moment, say, in, in a mindful moment, or the beauty of the the landscape in front of you or the people you're talking to or 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 whatever. Um, and you tap into these aesthetic goods. So I think what beauty has going for it is is sort of stuff like that fulfillment that you can't really get in other ways. And I think if if you get it through friendship, it's often through the kind of aesthetic engagement that you, you know, friends typically um, engage in. And the other piece of the puzzle is that I think the practice of aesthetic valuing uh, is a source of goods that we can get elsewhere, but that the practice really sort of harvests these goods in the best possible way. And those goods are what I call aesthetic freedom or volitional openness. This idea that we can tap into a sense of freedom that's um, that's not dependent on our what you might call our autonomy or our self control. It's sort of it sort of breaks out of that sense of self control and, and it's like purely open or fully spontaneous or fully free in some sense. Um, the other is the cultivation of our individualities. So um, this idea that when we engage in aesthetic valuing, we um, we pursue um, a series of deepening choices about what to care about in aesthetic life, um, whether that's a certain kind of music or a certain kind of decor or a certain kind of fashion style or games or um, piano or poetry or whatever. Um, and aesthetic valuing sort of calls on us to do this, uh, um, you know, in a deeper and deeper way. So what's unique about beauty is that um, it has access to forms of fulfillment that we can't get in, in other practices and that it sources goods that um, we can get elsewhere, but that like we don't get them in such a sort of sort of full way. Um, yeah. I mean, why not just, so it seems like a lot of what you're saying is beauty is a place that leaves us to like freedom and individuality and respecting each other's individuality. But why not just go straight there? Why not just say like, okay, it feels like the book is you having a dialogue with someone and they're asking like, why be here? Why was I born? And an answer that I've seen in a lot of places in philosophy otherwise is freedom, your individuality, your freedom. And you answer something different. You say it's beauty, which will lead the way to a community of freedom. And I want to understand like why you think you need beauty instead of just saying to people directly, be free, do your own thing, be pure existentialists. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, at the end of the book, I really sort of endorse. So the, 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 the sort of force of the book is really not like just be yourself. It's like, you know, the existential imperative that I endorse at the end is Schiller's imperative to give freedom through freedom. So there's this kind of other regarding like your freedom is sort of something that's not just for yourself. It's given to another. And so like, why? Like, why is that important? Um, and then, of course, yeah, the flip side, like why? Why not just go directly for the goods? And um, the the answer ultimately is that your freedom isn't the best it can be. Your individuality isn't the best. So these constitutive goods, those can't be as th those are not going to be the best they can be without aesthetic community. So community sort of one way to put it is that community fully realizes these other goods or it or it perfects them. Um, so. It's only when, like, you can do all this discretionary value and you can, like, spend all this time sort of, like, you know, focusing on, you know, certain relationships of color in your painting or, um, you know, certain formal techniques in poetry or structures in novels and so on. And the thought is, that's all just going to be better when you share that or when you're attentive to the ad the advances or or the the aesthetic values of other people and you sort of are inspired by that, um, yeah. So that's that's the idea that aesthetic community is the highest good in aesthetic life. It it incorporates these other goods and raises them to a, to an even better good um, in in community. So I can see that some people in the chat 
are heavy or responsive. This sounds super elitist. This is like for the rich people, not the hungry people. Like, and I think you have a lot to say about that. So I'm going to open the door for you to respond. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm curious why it sounds that way. I mean, uh, it's certainly not intended to be that way at all. Maybe it's the examples I'm using, but so in a lot of my work, I make a really special effort to uh, claim that, you know, aesthetic value uh, is kind of everywhere. Um, it doesn't have to be in poetry. And I guess I am using like a lot of kind of like fine art examples, but, um, you know, it can be in streetwear, it can be in graffiti, it can be in uh, you know, bad films, um, as, as our bud Matt Stroll discusses, um, it can be kind of all over the place. And I, I don't, I don't really discriminate, you know, I, 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 um, I think that in fact, uh, an elite conception of aesthetic value is, is damaging to aesthetic life because it asks people to do something that they shouldn't do in aesthetic life, which is, um, value in a way that's aligned with how other people value, and that actually goes against this principle of discretionary valuing that I that I make a lot out of, which is the idea that one of the really special things about aesthetic life is that you can value things however you want. So in a lot of life, you can't, I mean, take morality, like you can't really just decide to value um, murder and disvalue love or to disvalue family or, um, or whatever. So there's a lot of things that uh, valuing or valuing is compulsory or, or, or sort of dictated by whatever the moral law or society or you know plug in your favorite you know moral theory in aesthetic life we we do the opposite we say you can do whatever you want you can value whatever you want um you know um, it's not to say that you can't make some mistakes it's just to say that you have a lot of liberty to say focus on the love of norwegian death metal um or of mozart or um you know experimental novels or you know, um, the Hunger Games novels or whatever. So you can kind of like, you know, you get to make these decisions and um, the, the, the idea that you should make them in line with an elite or in line with an expert uh, is very much, you know, not the way I think about aesthetic life. Can I try a quick reconstruction of all of your answers into one? So my question is, <laughs> Why is beauty special here? And it feels like your response is, beauty is the site of maximal human freedom. Everywhere else we're constrained by the needs of living, the needs of surviving, the needs, or even in morality, we're constrained by the, the deep demands of living with other people. And beauty is the space where we're free. And so if we want to appreciate each other as free beings, that's the place to do it. And so it's something like beauty is the place, the place where we have the most opportunity to be free and the place where the most opportunity to respect other people's freedom. Is that it? Yeah, that's nice. I like that way of putting it. Um, I wouldn't say respect other people's freedoms, but I would say um, in some sense, like spark other people's freedoms. Like it's the place where we like invite each other into this freedom through like, our individualities, which are the, in some sense, the representation of your path through aesthetic freedom. Like what, what comes out of you making these discretionary choices and you exercising volitional openness? Well, it's, your, it's the dispositions you have to laugh at certain things, to you know, stand in awe of certain things, to write in a certain way when you write poetry, to wear certain clothes when you get dressed and so on. That's your individuality. It's the kind of representation of how you've been free. Um, and we, when you let that shine, the idea is that that's supposed to like spark the freedom of others. Um, it won't spark the freedom of everyone, but um, it'll, it'll kind of like, you know, through your engagement in the practice of aesthetic valuing, imitating, sharing, self-expressing, you sort of make your aesthetic freedom visible as a thing to be you know, appreciated as itself beautiful um, and thereby as itself sort of imitable, shareable, um, and so on. People in the chat have picked up on the fact that this is this is Kantian. And I should just tell everyone, Nick is very open about being Kantian AF and that this is, I think, I mean. <laughs> we should... I mean, well, I would qualify that because I, I mean, I wonder what people have in mind when they say it's Kantian. I mean, um, so I'm 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 anti-Kantian in a sense. I I've written papers on 
you know, how I don't believe in the idea that um, aesthetic valuing is disinterested. Um, I've written this long paper on Schiller where I think of Schiller as kind of anti-Kantian, although he incorporates some Kantian insights. I don't think at the end of the day he can accept Kant's fundamental principles. Um, the the emphasis on freedom, I guess, is is something that has a Kantian flavor. But um, but I think in a lot of the details, I'm I'm not a Kantian. I really don't believe that aesthetic claims issue demands for agreement. I think that goes against again, it goes against some of the basic principles of aesthetic life. Um, I've also published stuff about that. But uh, but yeah, there you know, in aesthetics, it's hard to avoid Kant. Like you have to <laughs> you kind of have to confront the, the sort of Kantian history of a lot of aesthetics. Um, I spent a lot of time doing that. And I, although I love Kant very, very much, I, I don't think I'm a Kantian. I'm, I'm more of a kind of anti-Kantian in a lot of ways. Okay, we're getting towards the end of our question period. And this is where I get to ask the questions that have made me all hot and bothered about this book that I'm super excited about. <laughs> so here's the first one. So in the end, would you say that like for you, the value of beauty and aesthetic value, does that turn out? to be a social value? Or is it like a gateway to a different social value? Um, like if I we guess, poke at beauty long enough yeah. and I keep asking you why is this valuable, do we get to, a, to an answer in terms of it's community building, that's why it's valuable. Or is it like mm. this other value in itself that also opens the door to this like rich magical form of community? Uh, no, I mean, the yeah, in the view, in the sort of communitarian aesthetics that I'm developing, the the sort of fundamental answer within the practice of aesthetic value is that is that it's the good of aesthetic community. It's the sort of mutual recognition and sort of mutual vibing of you know with another person over you know over these over these over these um, over these goods. But their goodness is derivative from from the goodness inherent in that in that special form of community. It's kind of like love. It's like this. It's a, like kind of a lovey beauty. Love is kind of like interpersonal beauty. Love. So yeah, it's a social value. This is actually going to be one of my questions. What is the relationship between your account of this kind of beauty and just the idea of love? Like at some point, it starts to sound like you could substitute a lot of your language. Say the community is loving things together and like being in love with yeah. things and sharing how like rich and wonderful our loves are. Yeah. Yeah, um, it it yeah it comes down to not necessarily always sharing loves, but um, being in this mutually supportive aesthetic valuing practice with another with another aesthetic valuer as as such as an aesthetic valuer. So it's like um, you know you don't always have to share your aesthetic lives. Like you might actually have really different uh, aesthetic valuing practices, different individualities. Um, but nonetheless have this kind of mutually supportive um, relationship where, um, uh, I don't know, I like to think of Matt Stroll here who has really distinctive takes on on film that are really different from mine. They're, uh, we just, like, I, don't, I think we have really different reactions to films, but I always wanna know what Matt thinks. Um, and there's a sense in which you know, his, his individuality shines so strongly when it comes to film that I, it sort of like inspires my own aesthetic life. Um, uh, my own film viewing and 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 my own the, my own ways of thinking about film. I don't just adopt Matt's way of thinking. That would be impossible for me, I think. Um, but uh, I do sort of always like carry it with me in this way that I think is really enriching for my own aesthetic life. And that's the kind of thing I have in mind. It might be that sometimes we share aesthetic loves. Um, I mean, you and I share a kind of aesthetic love of of um, mezcal, um, espresso, other things, but. Um, there's, uh, and that's like vibing in a different sense. It's like, you know, um, we like the same things or we get excited about similar things and so on. Um, so yeah, sorry. I, I sort of took that in a slightly different direction, but um, it's, it's love, it's aesthetic love, it's aesthetic community, but um, it's not always like, you know, you know, loving in the sort of Benjamin Bagley sense of like, sharing values and improvising over these shared values. It's, it can include that, I think, but often aesthetic life, because discretionary valuing is so important, because 
volitional openness is so important in aesthetic life. And we do these things in different ways. Um, we have to be sort of volitionally open to each other as individuals who've discretionarily valued in different, deeply different ways. Yeah, I'm trying to connect. So one of the things I see going on in the chat is a lot of people are worried that the kind of aesthetic communities you're talking about are imposing values from the top down or enforcing sameness. And that's not at all what I see in your view. Your view is one about mm -hmm. communities of people supporting each other in their like aesthetic individuality. But yeah. I, the question that I have though is the most fascinating part for me of your view is this view about the self-replicatingness of beauty. And mm -hmm. I'm really interested in whether there's a tension there or not between like this idea that what aesthetic community is, is about supporting and loving each other's individuality. This idea you have that another key notion of beauty is that you want to replicate it. And I always took that replication to be something like either making more things like that in some way or just sharing, right? And this is the... the I always feel this tension. This is like a deeply personal tension between thinking like everyone gets to have their own taste and thinking like, oh my God, this thing is so beautiful. Y'all got to see this or you're missing out. So, mm -hmm. I mean, does that make yeah. sense? So the question is about the relationship between self-replication and freedom. Yeah. I mean, so I think that, uh, you know, to give freedom through freedom, we have to make our freedom visible in some way, our sort of aesthetic valuing has to be expressed either through our aesthetic products, through the way we look, the way we talk, how we invite each other into aesthetic community with our aesthetic claims and so on. And um, I think that sort of, you know, I make a big deal of imitation um, where in aesthetic life, often what we're doing is using someone else as a model for our own, as a good model for our own aesthetic lives. I mean, whether you want to sort of like dress like David Bowie or, or sing like Adele, or um, or uh, create a kind of fashion and theatrical persona like Zendaya or something. You know, there's all these different ways in which people get kind of moved by other people. It's imitation in my sense, but it's not mimicry. It's not simply like, I'm just gonna take this thing and replicate it like one, one to one. Um, it's an exercise of discretionary valuing uh, to sort of like choose that like, this is the, you know, this is the model for my, aesthetic action so i don't think so i don't think it's in tension with the kind of freedom and love that i that i emphasize i think it's it serves it really i think we're at the time in which anthony has asked us to shift oh, yeah. over that to seems right q and so anthony do you want to do you want to carry us into the next stage i'll do my best T. thank you thanks so much for that great conversation also for all of the um comments and T for your unique ability to be listening to Nick asking questions and to keeping a track of the chat that that's unprecedented in my experience so thank you that's that really good. I yeah. think helped to give this very dynamic um, conversational feel between you two and the audience so anyway I'll get cracking into the questions that have come in some of which I think have already already been asked in one way or another but Jeremy asks um whether you would well, whether there's a difference worth discussing between soulful beauty and aesthetic beauty and he notes he's using the kind of ordinary language here um, and if there is a difference what what is it and should we be thinking of soulful beauty in broadly moral or ethical ways oh so like the idea that a soul can be beautiful or like a personality or something like that is that the thought i mean this is always the problem with um with kind yeah. of the, the written thing is that I wasn't too yeah. sure in common language what soulful beauty means, but um, me, I would imagine yeah, me, Jeremy will come back in a second with a clarification there. So, I I have a sort of take on that general thought, which you know, in a lot of theories of aesthetic value, well, especially in aesthetic hedonism, it's been hard to make sense of the aesthetic value of things that aren't sensible, like um, you know, souls or uh, mathematics or you know, the formal structure of a literary work and um and you know part of part of what i like about my communitarian view is that um aesthetic values what's worthy of aesthetic valuing um a lot of things can be incorporated into that there's no there's no restriction to the sensory um this is sort of a con this is sort of kantian baggage that i also don't like um you know whatever can be taken up into this general social practice um 
in, in, in the sort of in the aesthetic way is fair game, whether that's, you know, a, a mathematical equation or uh, your sense of a person's personality or soul or, um, or the formal structure of a novel, whatever it is, yeah. Cool, yeah, I think one you. thing in the background that might just be interesting for people to know is, oh, by the way, I think the reason I'm I'm good at pulling off the chat is I did this for teaching 70 person classes on Zoom for two years during the pandemic. Um, anyway, I think there's some alignments uh, that it might be good for people to know about. I think there's one way of thinking about beauty is it's this high art thing, the experts define it. I think there's another kind of movement. Some people call it everyday aesthetics. I really... I find a lot of it in John Dewey's stuff about how what art is, is finding things in everyday life that has this resonance and crystallization and like just sharpening them up. And so I think Nick and I and people like Yuriko Sato and John Dewey are all in the space of like, like, don't make the confusion that art and beauty is this high elite thing. Like that's a kind of capture that we shouldn't, that we should push away. What we really want to talk about is the kind of everyday aesthetic community and maybe a better model for a lot of the stuff that might help I think see what Nick is doing apart from these kind of worries about elitism so I think Nick's view fits with cosplay I mean it works with the street art Nick's written on street art it works with I think a lot of the times like a lot of this kind of here's a place with like very not only rich aesthetic community, the world of like D&D players coming up with their own campaigns and exchanging them. Those are the kinds of like, those are the kinds of aesthetic communities that Nick is talking about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They're not, yeah, that's nicely put, T. Cool, so we're gonna go on to um, Alice's question. Um, so Alice picks up on something T was discussing with you earlier about the what she calls the hyper interpretability of um, slogans like seize the day. And Alice is wondering whether what these slogans convey is more like an attitude of valuing than any actual content, something like sincerity, openness or earnestness. And then she asks, is this are these attitudes specifically aesthetic att attitudes? Um, and then a second question is what makes an attitude or a way of valuing distinctly aesthetic on your view? Yeah, good. Um, so yes, the answer to the first question is yes. Uh, the idea is that, well, take YOLO, you know, I think one of the nice ways of interpreting it is, you know, essentially like give freedom through freedom, right? Um, tap into the sense of being really spontaneous and free and adventurous and and do that, of course. Um, a lot of people sort of take that too far and risk their lives and so on. And so there's ways of doing it well and not so well. But um, you know, what makes you know what so there's a slightly tricky question here uh, about whether that kind of freedom is aesthetic. So that's kind of like think of this as like a demarcation question, like what makes something aesthetic, right? Um, as opposed to non-aesthetic. And a lot of my sort of theory building is around the around a different question, which is what makes aesthetic value good. And my answer to that question, which philosophers and aesthetics call the value question, is aesthetic community, which is built up out of and, and then you know, um, not 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 solely out of, but which which includes as as constituents sort of individuality or discretionary value and volitional openness, this kind of aesthetic freedom. To ask, to ask whether volitional openness, this like constituent of the highest good of aesthetic life is itself aesthetic, it's kind of like asking the hedonist or the, or the say, it's kind of like asking the utilitarian whether pleasure is ethically, is an ethical good. Um, philosophically speaking, in, to my mind, that's a, that's a slightly awkward question, right? It's kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's just like, it's the good. It's, <laughs> is, it, is it itself, uh, you know, an ethical good? Um, for the utilitarian, it's kind of like, it's just part of what the good is, the ethical good anyway. Um, and so I, I sort of want to claim a similar awkwardness for the trying to demarcate. I mean, it just so happens that, you know, aesthetic values is worthy of aesthetic valuing, or that's this social practice that's governed by these other goods. They can get the sort of honorific aesthetic um, just by being part of this practice, but, um, but in a way, I'm sort of not too concerned with like, trying to demarcate them in certain ways like that. 
Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm not sure if Nick is exactly where I am, but I think there's a school that neither of us are part of that maybe we're flirting with uh, of like what gets called aesthetic attitude theories. So what some people think is like, what makes something aesthetic is something about the thing. A lot of other people you might think on is like this. Jerome Stolnitz was openly like this. Think, no, what makes what's important about the aesthetic is the attitude you bring to it. So Stolnitz said something like, look, you can have a practical attitude where you're just looking at what you can get out of the thing. You can have an aesthetic attitude where you're open to like anything about the experience. And aesthetic, the aesthetic attitude is just looking at things without seeking some practical purpose. And at that point, people, some people respond like, oh my God, does that mean that anything could be aesthetic? And I think people like Nick and me want to be like, yeah, like what's bad about that, right? It's not that everything is, but it could be. And wouldn't that be kind of a cooler life? Now you might respond, oh my God, now I can't, not every, like that would drive me nuts. I can't be aesthetic all the time. I think one of the neat features about a view like Nick's is that okay, cool, you don't have to be aesthetic about everything, but there's all this unclaimed aesthetic territory and you and your community can move into a space. And I think one of the things you find is a lot of the times certain aesthetic realms get kind of tired out. Like there's just so much theory to learn. And I think what you see is people kind of decamping to a new area and trying to make their own aesthetic life in some place new. And then they get to be the innovators and then they get to be, right? And because if that's true of everything, it's cool that, and I think Nick and I are really on the same page here. Uh, it's cool that there's some people that get obsessive about coffee and some people can get obsessive about graffiti and some people can get obsessive about sushi and some people can be obsessive about architecture and some people can be obsessive about exact Nick is really good at rolling the cuffs he's he's a very stylish person and his cuff rolling is really good and that's never going to be me but I'm glad there's a community of people that clearly care about how you precisely roll your cuffs and in that in a world like that I'm, one of the interesting things for me is that's a very anti-elitist world that's not a world in which there's a small number of people to get control that's a world that you can go find your space Maybe it's D&D, &D, maybe it's avant-garde film, and be in the creative critical community where you get to be one of the makers. Yeah, totally. Nicely said. Thank you. So we're moving into the last five minutes. So, um, so one of the questions I thought I would ask is um, from Jana. And Jana picks up on the fact that um, Simone de Beauvoir has a kind of a critique or a reservation towards what she terms the aesthetic attitude. And um, so Jana fleshes that out by saying that, for example, um, the aesthetic attitude may be seen as a refusal to engage with moral responsibility for one's own projects beyond the aesthetic experience and especially the consequences. For example, there may be an aesthetic appreciation of air travel, which at the same time at an ethical or presumably also aesthetic level compounds climate change. That would be one example that Jana gives. So I guess it's a question about the interplay between aesthetics and ethics. Yeah, I mean, so <clears throat> the way I think about things, ethical matters, play into and and ideally support communities of aesthetic valuing. Um, so like in the history of American art, you know, there's there's this long history of racism against all kinds of performers and, and creators. Um, and that's like really damaged, that's really damaged um, aesthetic community in a lot of ways. It's also been an opportunity for people to be really innovative in their in their um, aesthetic practices. So there's a really nice book that argues that the very nature of coolness arose out of a racist jazz culture in the 30s and 40s. It's really convincing. Um, Lester Young, the saxophonist, um, was trying to find a way to protect his aesthetic community. And he did it by, instead of getting hot on stage and, you know, caving into sort of the white audience's demand to, to help them dance. He would, you know, uh, solo with his saxophone at like a, a kind of an angle turned away from the audience. He would wear sunglasses. He spoke in this idiolect that he made up basically. Um, and, you know, this was cool. That's what coolness was in the thirties. Of course, it transformed over, over the decades to become something quite different, but 
um, coolness was a way of saying, hey, I'm going to do my own thing and my and my jazz mates are going to riff on this and, you know, feel it if you want, but like you're over there, we're over here. and we're gonna... So there's kind of a way of protecting aesthetic community, um, these sort of aesthetic strategies, as it were, uh, against, you know, basically saying, hey, respect us, like respect what we're doing, respect us as human beings, as artists, so that we can invent the most seismic, you know, artistic form uh, of the 20th century. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I think that, um, you know, with anything in, in life, I think there's going to be some moral considerations. There's going to be some aesthetic considerations. Um, there's always this question of how they, how do you balance them? Uh, and I think as long as we have in, as long as we have in view that there are different practices that have different goods, um, you know, the, the as it were, a kingdom of ends or a sort of mutually respectable sort of, um, or mutually respecting community of human beings as such. So I'm very Kantian, I think, in the way I tend to think about morality, but um, versus like a community of individuals that are trying to give freedom through freedom. Um, you know, ideally, they're also like always respecting each other. That's, you know, we live in a non-ideal world and things are complicated. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just want to, caution against I mean I think Nick and I have different here we're going to diverge I just want to caution against conflating the two possible views one view is the view that being always aesthetic is as someone said in the chat pathological if you refuse to look at like the uh, moral and environmental consequences there's something really screwed up about that and I agree like but I also think there's another view you could have which is it's also important to have a space where sometimes you withdraw from that and you see a different set of considerations where you sometimes you spend a little bit of time not constantly looking at the kind of practical downstream consequences. And that might be a good attitudinal movement. There's also one thing that uh, I find really striking. Eric Mathis, another friend of ours who writes in philosophy of art about the relationship between art and morality. The most striking thing he said to me is, I mean, he really cares about how morality deeply inf like is connected into the aesthetic. But he also said something like, you know, I'm really tired of like reviews that only talk about the political or the moral, because sometimes it's like a review about donuts. Like, I know it's unhealthy. I want to know if it's worth it. And once in a while, <laughs> it's worth it. And I find that interesting, too. Anyway, that's. Yeah, yeah. No, I like that. Yeah. Thank you. So we're, we're pretty much at time. So I guess we'll do a couple of quick fire questions because I definitely want to ask this one because it was asked early and by someone who appears, um, who attends regularly, but I'll try and sum it up. So basically the idea is that um, there is a life force and then there's our life. And so your book, one of the chaps is th this life. So I, I think he's asking about what's the relationship between the, the life force and our life. So the question is, who are we to make the decision that life is worthwhile or not? <laughs> I don't know if that's a that's my attempt to condense the question. I don't know if it is um, if I did a good job of trying to condense it or not. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, we we we're, we're we're the ones to make the decisions because we're the ones who are alive. I mean. And you know we're the ones who are in this strange existential predicament where we didn't choose to live. Uh, someone brought us into this world uh, unbidden, and here we are. Um, and so, if we're going to stick around, like we get to decide what 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 makes it worth sticking around. Um, you know, I I make a big deal about this distinction in the book between um, sort of the, the the sort of enemy in the book or the sort of friendly foe is um, is the what I call the preservationist. And so they care about a certain sense of life or the life force, like this sort of biological sense, like their whole life is determined by the thought that merely being alive as an organism, as a biological organism is, is enough to make life worth living. And just maintaining homeostasis, um, keeping the epidermis intact, like, um, you know, you know, uh, being healthy and so on as, a, as, a, as an embodied biological being is enough to make life worth living. And they're the person who might respond to YOLO by saying, well, you ought to look out because, you know, my skin could be punctured. Um, I can get a virus, you know, I might as well just cultivate a kind of healthy agoraphobia um, 
not take any risks. So like, why, the question, one, one of the ways of posing the question at the center of the book is like, why are they wrong? Like, are they wrong? And if so, why? Um, and so the thought is, while they tap into a sense of the value of being alive, it's only a part of what you can tap into. Um, the sort of embodied sense that my body is, is lovely and precious and special. Um, well, yeah, your body is beautiful, but its beauty is, doesn't reside solely in its, you know, you know, your clean skin and your wonderful heart rate and, um, and your, and, and your nutritious blood or whatever. Um, you know, there's more to it than that. And in fact, the body's, uh, sort of aesthetic power goes way beyond, uh, way beyond that, um, into how we can use the body as a kind of conduit into aesthetic life by getting tattoos and piercings and, um, you know, uh, doing certain things with our body, movements, dances, uh, holding it in a certain way, walking in a certain way, um, these more dynamic and sort of uh, artistic ways of bringing the body into beauty. So, um, so yeah, I think that there's a sense of the life force that's like way bigger than just sort of this biological sense. And the book is really about kind of like bringing that into view and sort of inviting other people people into it.